Yeah, yeah more coffee and chocolate. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, I don't know what you lot out there are drinking, but we can't start without our chocolate and coffee. <laughs> mm. Tea is the other good drink. Mm -hmm. um, so in the last uh, video, we showed you um, the types of sources of information that we have. Uh, but now we're going to plan a particular passage. And the passage uh, starts at um, Belfast Lock. And it ends at uh, Liverpool. Uh, the passage overall is just over 100 nautical miles. Uh, so for this particular passage we're going to use the Irish Sea Pilot. And we'll also refer to things in Reed's Nautical Aldermac. Now you saw both of these in the previous video to this which was sources of information. And of course the particular chart we'll be using is um, this um, Imre chart of the Irish Sea. So what we're going to do today is we're not actually doing the detailed passage plan of what precise, what precise time I'm going to leave at, what precise time I'm going to arrive at. The reason we're not doing it is because we're not going for two or three weeks yet and so we've no idea what the weather will be. We're, we could look up the tides, things like that, but it's the weather's the killer. Mm. Uh, so what we've done instead, as we said to you before, is we've looked at the route and we have looked at all the places we can go and we've looked at our backup plans. And we're going to go into those in detail and show you how we use the sources of information from the last video and summarise it up so that when we get to the actual day of departure, we can drop the detail plan for the following day and then we have useful information. And at the end of all this, uh, we'll go and look at an existing passage plan that we used to get here from Hollyhead to Belfast six months ago. It's still in the passage planning book, we haven't thrown it out. So we can go over that and you can see how one of these turned into an actual detailed plan. But the detailed plan itself won't turn up for a few weeks yet. The first thing we do is we look at the ports that information refers to. Um, in some of the um, notes we've got information referred to Bangor, Others it's Liverpool and some it's Dover. So what we do is we um, get them all referred to one port, in this case Dover. Now in around the UK, Dover is classed as your primary port where Bangor and um, Belfast Oh, and Liverpool are classed as your secondary ports. And Hollyhead and Galway, places like that. But in this particular passage, Liverpool and um, Bang uh, Belfast are your secondary um, ports. If you look in the tide passages that come with the charts, they're all referred to Dover, not to Belfast. Similarly, when you look in Reeds, or say getting toward Liverpool, the times are referred to Liverpool, not to Belfast, not to Dover. So you've got three ports and in an area that you're traversing, because you're traversing, say we go straight there, say we go straight from Belfast all the way over to Liverpool. That means that we are going from the Belfast port to the Liverpool port, two different tidal sets there, and we're going through an area where all the tides are defined on the chart for Dover. So we've got three different sets of information. So job number one is to bring them all to a common reference standard. And generally it's easier to bring them all to Dover. It might be on the area you're in, it might be better to bring them to say Belfast or to Liverpool or to Galway or to Hollyhead. It just depends on the passage you're making. This particular instance, Dover is easiest for us. Mm. Now, if you uh, look in, um, we got the information from Reeds. Uh, Belfast is plus or set, uh, minus? It's seven minutes ahead of Dover. So it's seven minutes ahead of uh, Dover times. But in the book, we only put that in as ten minutes. If we can keep it to good numbers, easy numbers for us like that, it just makes it easier for us to do the detail plan later. Can I just throw in a little interjection at this point? Yeah. One thing we don't do when we're sailing is we don't get overly exact. You know, we don't worry about calculating tidal heights to the last centimetre. We don't worry about calculating tidal shifts to the last minute. Um, we don't worry about setting our course on magnetic to the nearest T 
tenth of one degree. It doesn't work like that out there. Uh, when we're out there, if we've got less than a metre under the keel, we sort of get twitchy. So working it out to a centimetre is neither here nor there. Um, having your course defined half a degree, the boat tends to get rocked around in the waves. If we can hold it within five degrees, we're generally quite happy with that because we're going the right direction. So having the tidal times shifted from Belfast being Dover plus seven to Dover plus ten, the ten just makes the arithmetic easier for us. It's not going to make any real difference when we're out there. Um, it was on one of them, but... Okay, so we've um, got all our information standardised to um, our main port, which is Dover. So the next thing I've done is I've drawn up a sketch of the area. It's not a particularly brilliant sketch. I'm not going to win any artistry prizes. Um, but for our purposes, it shows us where we want to go and what we want to do. Um, so the, once we've actually got our plan, we then find out where the tidal gates are. Now, just to be clear again, a tidal gate, um, people have seen gates on marinas. They're flats that lift up and down and protect the water in the marina. A tidal gate doesn't necessarily have to have anything attached to it. It's just an area of tide you have to get through at a particular time or you don't get through at all. Quite simply, it's like a gate that keeps you out if you miss it. So when we say a tidal gate, we're talking about an area that we have to go through by a certain time or we don't get through it because of the tide being so strong. Um, in Peel, um, the gate is a physical piece um, of metal, piece of metal that goes up and down. So that is a physical gate. Whereas going into Strangford Lock, um, in the pilotage, it refers to you need to be going in um, no later, no later than the last hour of the flood. Of the flood, yeah. so um, that's and you need to leave at least a whole hour for the passage itself. So you need to be getting there at sort of like two hours beforehand. So that's what we call a tidal gate. So and in this passage, there's quite a few different gates. We have got Copeland Sound, which we've gone through a couple of times, haven't we, Bev? We have indeed. Um, and that's just um, a small channel between the Copeland Islands and the mainland. And... Um, because it's a small channel, the tide can whip through there at quite a quite a rate of knots. And if you miss it, if you have the tide against you, you mightn't get through. Yeah, you um, because the tide uh, will run up say seven to eight knots. <laughs> if you make five through the water, you're, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you're going backwards. <laughs> even even if the tide's running at five knots and you do five knots, you're just staying where you are. There's no point in trying. So, <laughs> yeah. so and it will go through the Copeland Sound. So as about you, eight. Yeah. So as you can see on this diagram, what we've done is we've marked out the, the choke points, the tidal gates and things like that. Anything that gets in our way and just stops a straight sail. So we've got Copeland Sound because you've got to get through it at a certain time. We've got Strangford Narrows because you can get to that by a certain time and you've got a certain time to get through it. Um, we've put the Calf of Man, Calf Sound, which is once again um, strong tides in the area and you have a particular, that's like 15, 30 minutes slot to get through that when the tide changes. And we've put down Chicken Rock, uh, the south of the Isle of Man, because it gets very lumpy and bumpy there, as we found out to our horror a couple of years ago, if you hit it at the wrong time. So it's not really a tidal gate, but you just don't want to be there at the wrong time. So on the chart that we've done, the little picture we've done, we've marked out all the ports we're going to and we've marked out the approximate distances between them to the nearest five miles. Once again I'm not being very exact about this and time is distance is time on a sailboat. We do an average of five knots so if we're doing a 20 mile passage it's going to take us four hours. That's just the way it is. Um, the tide round here changes every six hours and it's quite a strong tide so in six hours we can do 30 nautical miles so where will I be in 30 in 30 miles time and six hours time when the tide changes is that going to make a difference to me so these are all things that we can work out and you can see here that we have written down the Isle of Man stuff for Calf Sound and Chicken Rock we have made a note of peel and it's time so what time the, the flat gate drops and things like that on this side we have made a note of Copeland Sound and also the time at which the stream through Copeland changes direction southeast and northwest 
and we've made some notes about Strangford and what's the best admiralty chart to look up. So all this information has been taken out of these books and summarised into this one page. Um, what we also do is we always have a backup plan. So for instance, if we do not get to um, the entrance of um, the lock at the right time, where do we go as a backup? And in that case, it'll be our glass. And as you can see here in the chart, it's five miles to our glass, which is another hour's at sailing. It's another hour to sailing, but the window that you can get in uh, to our glass is plus or minus five oh. hours. It's only the does right. Of a window? I don't think it does. It's only for our boat. We're all right, mm. but you don't want to go in at um, chart datum. Right. As long as it's got a, a half a meter of the under the keel, you're fine. Right. Um, so we are. So um, our glass is our backup uh, for peel. It's got a um, gate. But we know that there's a harbour wall, plus there's some moorings outside of Peel, so that is our backup. Um, going into um, Liverpool, you really, it's much better to go into Liverpool going in with the tide. But you know what, you can stay out in the Irish at, at Sea. Liverpool, at Liverpool, in the Mersey, timing is very, very important because if you arrive there at the wrong time, you won't get in anywhere. It's as simple as that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but we do know that there's some moorings and there's a, an anchorage um, just off um, Brighton. Tower Cardinal. Tower, in round Tower Cardinal. Uh, we can drop an anchor there um, so that we can stay there while we wait for the... Um, the, the tidal the, the lock gate mm. but we've got a backup as to where we can go if we can't meet the gates that is very important now something else that will happen and one of the reasons that we're being very undefinite about this is because we don't know the weather in advance nobody knows what weather's doing in three weeks time don't care what they tell you um so if on the day we want to leave um there are strong southerly winds coming up the irish sea then we can't go to our glass, it's as simple as that, because we'll be beating all the way down, we might have wind over tide against us, it could be a horrible journey. Mm. Um, so on that particular day, we might decide to go to Peel, because it's a southeasterly course, and we could sail close hauled, or maybe even with the wind on our beam, if the wind's a little bit to the southwest, but we couldn't maybe make it to our glass, mm. or uh, to Strangford. So in that particular instance, we either have to wait till the weather changes, if we can, or we might decide that, no, we're just going to have to bite the bullet. strangford has been there for a few million years and it'll probably last another couple of weeks. Um, and just bite the bullet, go to the Isle of Man and then work our way around to Liverpool from there. So this plan gives us the flexibility to choose right up to the day before we leave. This is a plan from last year. This is a plan that we used to get from Hollyhead to Belfast. And... There's not as much pictures or anything on this because it was quite a simple plan. It was leave Hollyhead, go to Belfast, that's it. And also there was only one choke point um, in the um, plan, which was the Copeland Sounds. Um, other than that, yes, you might have tide going against you at various points, but because of the length of the passage, you're never going to get away from that. No. Um, so it doesn't matter if you have the tide against you at the early part or the latter part it's going to be against you at some point. Um, you just try and choose what is the most advantage to you for getting to the end points. There wasn't also much in the way of backups on this particular one, because once you leave Hollyhead, if you're heading for Belfast, there's nothing out there. As it was, we did actually go to the backup, which was our glass. glass. Um, so we did have one backup. Um but as Beverly says, once you start the um, once you start that particular passage, you're pretty much committed. You're committed for about a good ten hours. Yes. Um. So you need to have the weather that that will allow you to do a ten hour passage. So as you can see on this, the only doodle we have is the entrance to Belfast Lock through Copeland Sound and some notes about when the stream changes direction. And you can see down here on the bottom. We've got the times of day that we can come through the stream. So it turned out that we did it the following day. So um, it was actually two days later because we, we had that storm. storm. 
Yeah. And that's why we basically went there as well. Yes. You know. Um, you can see here that we've got notes from... It says from Hollyhead to Copeland Sound, it takes approximately 17 hours and therefore if we need to leave at this time to arrive at that time. So we timed our departure to suit our time of arrival at the other end. And the main thing that we put in this is weather. Yes. You know, we can't, uh, when we're doing the general plan, you can't put in the weather. You don't put the weather in. You just put in um, the tidal information. Um, whereas in this one, it's more about the weather and where can we go with that wind direction to suit us. Yes, so as you can see here in the bottom of the opposite page, we've put in the weather for the, the date and the weather for the following 24 hours. It's a 17 hour passage. We've got 48 hours worth of weather here. Mm. But all this is the sort of thing that the plan we show you will wind up being eventually. But until we know the weather, we can't set the plan in stone. Mm. You know? um, I'll just point out one other thing and you will see that here, here and here, we've got the tide times for the three standard ports that we were dealing with in this passage, Dover, Belfast and Hollyhead. We've got the high waters and low waters in all of them. And we've also got, as I said, the windows and the stream changes at the tidal gate at Copeland. Okay, dokey. So um, we hope uh, that will be of use to you. Um, our, when we finally leave... Um, in a few weeks. Leave in a few weeks. We will then burrow down into the um, Pacifics, um, but when we actually have the information at that time. Yes, we will convert the general plan that we've shown you here into a detailed plan like this one. Hmm. And I think that basically wraps this up. Yeah, that's roughly about what we're going to say. Yeah, so we'll finish off the coffee. And uh, cheers, talk to you later.